Perhaps one of the most asked questions from people about the Bible is the title of the message this morning. Where did Cain get his wife? One of the sites I frequently recommend to you and commend to you even this morning uh, is a site called Got Questions, gotquestions.org. If you ever have any questions about the Bible, um, about spiritually related things, or you want to steer somebody uh, who you're talking to at work, this is a great site. I've recommended it uh, a number of different times, different articles that are there. Uh, George is not here with us this morning, my brother George Pappas. Keep, continue to pray for him. Uh, Marty has had uh, not a very good weekend physically, uh, and they would both appreciate your prayers uh, that way. Uh, another prayer request I'll throw out for you is uh, Terry, uh, Richard and Mary Lou Thorson's uh, daughter-in-law, uh, has had a brain bleed, and she's having some struggles and difficulties as well. They would ask for prayer for Terry and their son. Uh, but let's just remember, in fact, let's just pause and remember both of those families here this morning. Thank you, Father, for the privilege that we have to gather here this morning. We thank you for uh, the relationship that we have because of Jesus Christ, uh, the, the, the connection that we have here as a congregation. And as we lift up uh, our dear brothers and sisters here before you this morning, we do pray for the Pappases. Uh, we know that George has been a faithful picture of what it means to be a, a godly husband investing in his wife, uh, and we pray, Lord, right now as they're, they're making difficult decisions, they're encountering uh, some challenges here with Marty's failing health, uh, that you would give them wisdom, uh, you would give them guidance, and you would give them strength and encouragement. Help them to know that their brothers and sisters here at Calvary are praying for them uh, and stand behind them. Uh, and we pray, Lord, for wisdom and for protection and for health. We pray as well the same thing for Richard and Mary Lou, knowing that they're... Uh, aging themselves. It's, it's a struggle to be here physically on a, any kind of a regular basis at all. Uh, it's really a struggle for, for some of the things that they just have to navigate through uh, from day-to-day -day living. But we know that this matter, particularly with their daughter-in-law, Terry, is, is resting heavily on their hearts. Uh, Lord, when we confront situations like this, we feel helpless. Uh, we feel uh, sometimes anxiety and uncertainty. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would quiet their hearts. We pray that you would touch our sister here uh, as, as she's struggling physically. Uh, give them confidence. Give them strength that is anchored in you. Uh, and we thank you again for those who are faithfully caring for them uh, and showing the love of Christ to them. Uh, we lift them before you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Even as though I was talking, I was invoking my brother's name, George is one of those people uh, who loves to teach the Word. He'll be teaching that Sunday school class here, uh, team teaching with Ricky, and he'll be doing this in a couple of weeks, going through uh, Second Thessalonians. Uh, and one of the reasons he loves Second Thessalonians is because Second Thessalonians touches on things having to do with the end times, with the return of our Lord, which excites George and really, frankly, ought to excite more of us as well. We pray with John as he closes Revelation and closes the New Testament, even so come Lord Jesus. And this is our expectation that we have. But Got Questions, and so that's how we kind of got all the way around here, that website, Got Questions, shares our dispensational philosophy, our dispensational interpretation of the scriptures. And so I find it a very valuable resource that way. But they can touch on a lot of different things. Uh, they can answer questions about uh, human sexuality and what, what that looks like today and how Christians should be thinking through some of those issues. They can answer questions, like they, there's a question in there on what is the GARBC, which is our, our, our association. You can get a little bit of history there. But the, the seventh most asked question on that site, the one that people go to, the, one of the ones they go to the most is this question on the screen. Where did Cain get his wife? And there's some kind of it's like sometimes people who are skeptical of Christianity tend to think, oh, that's an aha kind of question. How can you answer that? Uh, if God really created the universe uh, in six days and created Adam and Eve and there, there's no other people around, that's kind of a problem for you, isn't it? Because the Bible also forbids incestuous relationships. And they think, aha, now see, that, that proves our point. There were more human beings, or maybe this whole thing that you guys think you have figured out 
uh, with the, the literal creation story maybe doesn't hold water. But for the literal interpretation of Scripture for where we would sit, we have to answer that question, and that's not going to be the main focus of what's going on here, but what we are going to see is how we can start to think through these things biblically. And I would even say, if George were here this morning, from a dispensational point of view. But we'll be reading this morning Genesis chapter 4, beginning with verse 17. We are picking up in the narrative, if you were here with us last week, if you aren't here with us on a regular basis, we have been going verse by verse systematically through the book of Genesis. In fact, I started in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 earlier this year. So that kind of tells you the pace we've been going. Um, We're going to finish chapter 4 this morning, and I have told the congregation, and I promise you, we will pick up the pace a little bit. We're going to go more chapters instead of singular verses or spending a month on one set of verses, things like this. But where we pick up in the narrative this morning is in verse 17. God has just condemned Cain for the murder of his brother, and now the consequences of his actions are going to come to rest upon him. This is also one of the sections of Scripture that contains a genealogy. This is one of those places where the casual Bible reader will start to glaze over. If we're reading this around the room, uh, most of you are probably glad that the pastor gets to read this morning, and I don't have to say words like mehujael as we're reading around the verse so everybody can laugh at your pronunciation or you feel awkward. But there's a reason even here these genealogies are here, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in our uh, explanation and our application of the Scriptures this morning. So let's pick up again in chapter 4, verse 17, and we'll read down through the end of the chapter. If you're following along, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Hear the Word of God. Cain knew his wife. And I'll pause there. That means that they had sexual relations. That's a euphemism that's used. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael followed, fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal-Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Naamah. Lamech said to his two wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also was a son born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, and that on his pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. I often say that at the end of reading a passage of scripture, and sometimes that's easy to see. Like, how are we meeting Jesus Christ? We're reading Romans 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Shall persecution, and and it's like, it's inspiring. It's just like, wow, yes, he just comes alive out of these pages. It's a little bit more difficult for maybe for you to buy in. Like, how are we meeting Christ when we start talking about Tubal Cain, (laughs) A, a name I can barely pronounce, much less understand who this is? Why is this significant? What meaning does this have for me in my life? But what I want you to see, even as we read this passage this morning, is we're building to the point that the conclusion of this message that I'm going to 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 bring us to is that at you see at the end, we have to make God known. They began to call upon the name of the Lord. 
And so, as we understand what the point of this text is here, is that God gives to us goodness. God gives to us goodness. You say, well, pastor, how are you taking that out of this passage? Well, if you look earlier in the context of where we have just recently completed, what is God's punishment? What are the consequences of Cain's actions when he murders his brother? What does God condemn him to? You look in verse 12. God says this to Cain, when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. In other words, when Adam left the garden, when he was condemned and, and cast out of the Garden of Eden, what does God say? Well, he curses the ground, and he says there's going to be weeds, there's going to be thorns and thistles. You have to work the ground. That's where you're going to get your sustenance. That's where you're going to get your food. But it's going to be difficult. Now... To Cain, he says it's going to be even more complicated. It's going to be more difficult for you. When you personally work the ground, God places a curse on him. It shall no longer yield to you its strength. So it's going to be that much more difficult. You're going to have to rely on other people, but you're also going to be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. God has condemned him from having a place where he is anchored, where he has an identity, and removes from him the privilege that we all long for. God gives goodness. God gives to us good things. For example, a sense of place, a sense where we have our identity, where we can come together and find definition, can find purpose. Most of us here sitting in this room, although we have some visitors, so maybe you're, you're coming from outside and, and you're coming from away, you're just here in Rochester visiting the clinic or, or something like this. But most of us here in the room would call Rochester or Orinoco or Stewartville or Zimbroda. We'd call local places home. This is where we have an identity. We have an address that we can identify with. We have people that we share that abode with. We have things that make our living and dwelling place familiar for us. We have two golden retrievers that are eager to welcome us home uh, when we step in the door. There, there are familiar smells. There are familiar things that we can say. I, I can sit on my couch and, and put it on or, or put my feet out and root for, I'm not even sure which team anymore. The Patriots are not doing very good this year, so I, I will not do any boasting. or All my boast is in Jesus, Bill. <laughs> But there it is. Um, but in all seriousness, we have things that make it familiar, that make it a sense of belonging. But at the same time, that place is also that place because of the people that live under that roof. And when that house is empty, it, it, it can almost be a discouragement to us. It, it, can, it can bring in a, a sense of emptiness, of loneliness. When we come to live in a city, it can also be one of the things that actually magnifies us. And so when you're looking up here on the screen, you might have noticed at the beginning, God gives goodness. But when we start to go in here, uh, the picture becomes a little bit distorted. Because this is how Cain came to realize that the void in his life, the emptiness in his life, was because God had given humanity these things. And now he was a fugitive. He was a wanderer. He was somebody who had been deprived of these good things. You're hearing a buzz, and that, is, that has nothing to do, don't panic, that has to do with our air conditioning. <laughs> so that will be taken care of in just a moment, like right now. All right, but that means that God gives us these things, and these things can and have been from Cain removed. He's trying to replace the emptiness. He's trying to replace the void in his life with building a city, with building all these things that will replace what he's lost by being driven out of the community and by being driven away from his relationship with God. By the way, where did Cain get his wife? We'll answer that question here just briefly. 
what we see is Adam and Eve had children. We already know that they had Cain and Abel and Seth. But what do we also conclude from what is not written there? There had to have been others. Because people don't reproduce men spontaneously with men. All right, It, it just doesn't happen. That's, that's the, the literal biological thing that we have to deal with in society today, that, that, that awkward question. But that's the reality. And there's a lot of people, it even talks here about Cain building a city. People had to populate that city. There were a lot of people. When you look at how many years they were alive, which we'll see in the next chapter, in chapter 5, it tells us this, their lifespan was much greater than anything we know and enjoy today. And so these people were living for a very long time and they were able to reproduce. We don't know how old Cain and Abel were when this event that is described in chapter 4 occurred, but we can pretty much reasonably conclude that there were a lot of people alive in the world at this time. And so, yes, it might weird us out today, Cain likely married his sister or his niece or somebody like that. that. That's who he took up a relationship with. Now, you say, but pastor, doesn't that contradict what we see laid out for us in Scripture? Well, this is why we start talking about dispensations. There are different ways that God expects us to live different commandments and ways that we would conform to please God based on what time and period in history we're in. What was the only thing that God told Adam and Eve to do? That basically, don't, you can do anything you want to, just don't eat of this tree. Now, obviously, they didn't do very well at that. They, they, they stumbled and then got cast, themselves cast out of the garden. They lost their innocence. But that, they, they, there was a number of different things they were capable of doing. They didn't understand the difference between good and evil. And now they do. But there's a different expectation there. Now, you can't go back to the garden but there's still not a lot of definition yet. And so what we will conclude, among other things, is what now is condemned in the Bible and now condemned by our society, incestuous relationships, are not anything that's condemned at the point in time where Cain is taking a wife. So that's how we have to reason through it. That's a difficult question for people to, to, to wrestle with, a difficult answer, but it's not to say that the Bible contradicts itself any more than we are disobedient today because we're not offering animal sacrifices. Why don't we offer animal sacrifices? Because we live in a different era. And Jesus Christ became the once-for-all sacrifice and did away with those things. So we live in a different dispensation, different expectations. Okay, so that's what's going on. That's the answer to the question. Maybe the uncomfortable answer sometimes when you start initially trying to take that on, but when you start to reason through, you understand there's genetic things that probably some of the Mayo doctors here, Dr. Clay could probably wax eloquent on that, or, or Dr. Frisk uh, as far as the genetics and why it would work out better for them to have married back then, and maybe not so well for a brother and sister to marry today, the genetic uh, disqualifications and the different things that would, would come into that. I'm not going to focus too much on that. I'm going to answer the question, that's where he got his wife. But what we do see here, again, for our purposes, is this. There was not only the relationship that he was trying to fulfill, but he was trying to, to fill the emptiness, the void, that he had lost with God. That he knew something was missing. And that is what Jesus has come to do for us. Jesus himself would say that I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father, no man comes to God, except through me. And Christians today have this expectation that we are here to honor God, we are here to love God, we are here to have a relationship with God, but there is an oftentimes where when, it, when we find ourselves maybe doing Christian things or we're in the right place, but it's empty. We're missing something. This is what Jesus would point out to the church at Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3 
And, and you're familiar with many of these concepts. This is something that he talks about. I know your works. You are neither cold or hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. But, so because you are lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. And the, the, the concept there, there's different interpretations. My understanding of what's happening in this text is you're not hot and purifying and cleansing. You're not cold, spiritually refreshing. There, there were Laodicea would have been near two other cities, Herapolis and Colossae. And one had was well known for its hot springs where people would come for the medicinal value and, and get rid of their aches and pains. The other place had deep artesian wells where it was nice and cold. Laodicea was located not near a natural water source, so they had to build aqueducts to there. It was at the middle of, uh, of two crossroads on, on a commercial trading route. And so it had a very strategic location, but it wasn't built for its natural resources. And so with these aqueducts, they were very efficient to get water there, but they sat out in the hot sun, and so by the time the water got there, it was tepid, it just didn't taste good, and they didn't have water softeners, and they didn't have filters and those kind of things. And so the water was adequate for what they needed, but it wasn't pleasant. And that's what he's getting at here when he says, when you drink it and just kind of spew you out of my, it's no good. Nobody really appreciates this. Nobody values it. Nobody's buying bottles of this and taking it home, you know. And when Jesus rebukes them, he says, you're all self-sufficient onto yourself, but you skip to the end of the passage. He says, behold, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is talking to them. He's talking to a church. We often have heard this voice used in relation to salvation. That if you need Jesus, you need to, he's knocking on the door of your heart and you need to let him in and be saved. That's actually not what Jesus is saying here. What Jesus is saying is you have as a church grown so smug, so self-sufficient, trying to satisfy all these voids with everything else but me. And I'm on the outside. This is supposed to be my church, Jesus says. You're not letting me in. I'm on the outside. I want to have fellowship with you. But you're filling it with all these other things. And friends, that's what Cain is kind of finding out here. He has emptiness and he needs to fill it with God. And he's not going to repent. He's he's going to build himself a city. He's going to put all these things together. And kind of like what we find maybe even here in our modern day lifestyle or in our churches. There are things that we do to try to fill the emptiness, to try to fill the loneliness, to try to fill the void. But some of the most lonely people you're ever going to meet live in a city. Some of the most lonely people come to a place like Calvary Baptist Church. They complain and they feel isolated and they say, I don't know anybody. Nobody seems to care for me. And that's something that maybe we need to evaluate. And sometimes maybe the person who's feeling that might need to evaluate and say, where am I getting to know people? Am I, if you're only coming to this service, this is your exposure to the church, friend. I'm glad you're here. But this is not going to meet all of your needs. We're going to give you good teaching. Or if you're watching me on live stream, we're, we're, we're glad that you're watching there. But that's not going to help you Get to know somebody who's going to ask about you and pray for you and know where you are and know how to encourage you. That's why we have things like a a, a Sunday school class where you can get to know somebody or we have seniors fellowships or we have discipling things or you can make friends so that you can go out and have coffee. Those are things that we need to do. We forge the relationships here so that we can get to know each other, so we can love each other, so we can invest in each other, so we can be part of a functioning body and not just spectators at some kind of a second-rate show that's happening up here. This is not everything that it is. It is centered around the Word, but the Word needs to be understood and then applied and lived out together. We should not forget that. So, when we see that when we feel that loneliness, when we feel that emptiness, Jesus gives us a sense of place, 
God gives to us a sense of belonging in the body. We look after Jesus. We find a place where He is going to take us in. The psalmist says in Psalms 27, verses 7 through 10, Hear me aloud, O Lord, when I cry. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. And so, what does the psalmist's heart say to God? My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. And as a church, friends, we need to be that kind of a place that gives people that sense of belonging, that sense of identity. We look for a city like the author of Hebrews says Abraham and those other Old Testament characters of old would do, who are looking for a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And really, what God has for us when we gather in a church like this, is He is preparing us not just to get along here and to be functioning here, that's part of it. But He is preparing us to be part of of that holy city, the new Jerusalem, where we will all be together under the reign of King Jesus. We will be together functioning, singing His praises, serving Him, showing His grace and goodness, putting that on display. And we have that the relationship that we enjoy with Him and a relationship that we enjoy with each other. It is fueled by the Spirit who indwells our hearts. Romans 8, verse 16. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, that we have this sense of belonging. Our sense of identity doesn't just come with ourselves or like Cain trying to build this city and, and name it after his son and build up this community, this definition, and still finding himself empty. no. We have this relationship because of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is what gives us value. Some of you were here yesterday when we had the opportunity to honor the memory of our sister Sue Locke. I had the opportunity to preach to her family that sat right up here in these rows to my right. And there was a lot of things that we evaluated together and we could reflect on the blessings that there were in her life and some of the the heartaches and some of the the conflict that they experienced over time as well but what ultimately gave her her definition what ultimately could walk away appreciating is that she knew she was a sinner and that is what gave her hope because she could look to jesus and find salvation, could find assurance, could find that sense of belonging that she couldn't always find in her human relationships. This is what God gives to us, a place of, a sense of place, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose. And so you see that kind of happening here in this passage where it talks about some of these figures like Jubal, who is the father of those who play the lyre and pipe. Jabal, who is the one uh, who is the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Tubal Cain, who is the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. He, he's saying that these people found purpose in being productive. They, they found their definition, and like we might today, that's how we tend to introduce. Well, so, my name is Greg Linscott. What are you? Well, I'm a pastor. You know, what, Craig Frisk, oh, I'm retired. <laughs> uh, but I used to be a veterinarian. You know? and, and we have these different things that kind of give us that definition, that role. It's how we're productive. It's what we know what to do. They had that kind of stuff going for them too. But we also find that if we only defined ourselves by our work, as the old proverb, not in the Bible, says, All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. You know, you have to figure out how to have the balance in your life. And for the Christian, it's even more important because we can invest ourselves and overwork ourselves and find ourselves unsatisfied. The author of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I perceived that there is nothing better for them, for humanity, than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. 
also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his work. This is God's gift to man. So what you must understand is that work is a blessing. Work is something that God gives to us, but it's not meant to burn us out. It's also meant to be balanced with being able to enjoy the fruit of your labors, to be able to eat and drink, to be joyful, to take pleasure and take satisfaction, not just to be overly stressed, overly tired. You have to be able to balance it out. And also, learn to love what you do. And often how we can learn how to love what we do is when we see the benefit and the blessing it brings to others. And so we understand in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. And so, maybe you say, it's, it's really hard for me to, to find the joy in what I do. I'm just counting down the days till retirement. I'm counting down the days till this or that. You do it for God. You thank Him for the health and vitality to be able to do this. You thank Him, if nothing else, for the ability that what you're doing gives you the, the privilege and, and the, the responsibility as you earn a salary to care for your family, to be generous uh, to the Lord, to fund gospel proclamation, to be uh, uh, somebody who not, doesn't just have to provide for himself, but to give to those in need. Those are all things that are New Testament principles that we can rejoice in our productivity. Because in doing so, we follow the example of Christ, who came to do the work of him who sent him, and his work is what gives us life is what gives us forgiveness, is what gives us salvation. The last thing that we'll see in this section, God gives us a sense of place, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, and you see it uh, towards the end of the chapter in verse 23, a sense of justice. Lamech here, there's, there's different, by the way, uh, different people who are named Enoch and named Lamech. Lamech is also a, a common name of the man who would father Noah, who we're going to meet here in a few chapters, uh, who builds the ark. Everybody knows who Noah is. But this is a different Lamech, and it's a different Enoch. Those two men that we're going to talk about in the future come from the line of Seth. These men come from the line of Cain. Lamech is guilty of the second recorded murder. We don't know exactly who this is. Some have even theorized that it may be Lamech killed his great-grandfather Cain himself. And we don't know who that is. But what we do know is that as he exults in the heinous, evil, murderous act that he has done, if Cain's revenge, verse 24, is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. But there was no authority, there was no structure to hold him accountable for what he had done. It was a very loose, wild west, unregulated kind of a society that they lived in. In fact, later on, before the flood, it will say and will describe what the, the status of civilization was at that time. Every person did what was right in their own eyes. There was no sheriff in town. There was no structure. And so they could get away, quite literally, with murder. But God has given to us the gift of government, said the pastor two months before Election Day. <laughs> but we have to understand that the way that the Bible frames it, government, though it doesn't always function well, doesn't always do a good job. Government is given to us as a gift. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted, who, by whom? By God. And so we are commanded to submit ourselves to those ordinances, to those things, which it says, by the way, we have to pay our taxes. That's, that's not always the most pleasant and fun application, but it is something 
that God says is our reasonable expectation in our relationship with the government. What do we do when we have problems and we have concerns, like many of us do? We exercise our rights, and maybe we don't vote for the current administration. We vote to see change made. But once those, those votes are in and once the decisions are made, once the people are put in office, we are supposed to, as Peter says in 1 Peter 2.13, be subject to the Lord's sake for every human institution, whether it be to the emperor supreme or as to governors sent, as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that we pray for them, we obey them, we pray for them. And why? So that we might lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So we're not saying don't take part in political campaigns, don't run for office, don't try to affect change, but also there's a certain way that we go about doing it. And we figure out how to live peacefully. We figure out that even sometimes the people on the opposite side of our political roster are still there to perform a service and function so that we can still enjoy the privileges that we are even here this morning. And we can hear the word of God proclaimed. We can worship him without threat of government interference. And we embrace that. And we do what we can to support that. We do what we can to submit ourselves to the authorities that God has placed in our lives. So as we continue to work our way down the passage, we also see that Adam has another son that is recorded here, the line of Seth. And Seth's line stands out for what reason? Because at the end of this chapter, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So we, too, as Christians, as believers, must understand we are here because we have that void and we have filled it with God through Jesus Christ who has made the way for us to have that relationship with the Father. And we call on him. We declare his word. We spend time in prayer. We lift up his name and magnify his name in song. We worship him by giving of our time, money, and resources for investing in his purposes. What it means to call on the name of the Lord in this context meant that they were aware of him, first of all. They knew he was their creator, but they perpetuated this awareness of who he was. And that's what Christians are supposed to do here today. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. They see you being productive. And then what are they going to do if you're doing it right? Glorify your Father in heaven. What you do, how you live, reflects on God. If you're doing it right. If you're fulfilling your obligation as a believer. And so then we gather together and we show him adoration. We maintain awareness, put our light on display, and we show adoration. As we've already read from Psalm 27, God says, seek my face. And so our response back is, your face, Lord, do I seek. We need to be worshipers of God. We need to make God known. And if we do that, we will not fall into the error of Cain. We will be like the people that it records here. We will be known because we have pointed people to the glory and honor of God. And we have that revealed to us in the face of Jesus Christ. Father, we do thank you this morning for your love for us. We thank you for bringing us here to this passage and helping us to see that when we sin and when we bear the consequences of our sin, what happens is we damage and distort our relationship with you. But you, knowing that we could not rectify that situation on our own, sent your son to bear the penalty for our sins on the cross so that we could now have that relationship restored so that void could be filled. And Jesus Christ himself made that possible. We praise you for him. We love him. And we, we pledge our faithfulness to him. Help us to live for his honor and glory and help anyone here who does not know Jesus to know better who he is after what they've heard here this morning. We pray this in his name.